Good morning. Well, the other week we had, just before our service, some technical difficulties with our computer. Uh, the computer wouldn't turn on our Easy Worship program, which runs all of our slideshows, all our music, the sound, everything. We were down and it wasn't working. And there was this moment of panic. What do you do in moments like these well first off there's prayer lord help us figure out how to get this system running again but we also had to think like those it guys right have we turned it have we turned the computer on and off again has it restarted right rebooted right that's that's the word reboot the computer and that's and when we look at our passage here, as we, as we are moving through Colossians chapter 3 here, that's Paul's answer as, as part of routine maintenance to keep the system, that being our lives running smoothly, keeping our eyes on the prize. And uh, in chapter 3 here, Paul details those glitches, the things that are going wrong. And he offers the fix, the divine, divine reboot so to speak, that makes all the difference. Set your mind on things above, on the realities of heaven, our, our end, our goal, our objective, Christ Jesus, right? And last week we mentioned that when Christ returns, we will also share in his glory. What a promise. What an amazing promise and encouragement for us as believers. And so, we see here that the stage is set. Paul turns our focus again to the towards the risen, the exalted Christ who is seated in power at God's right hand. And he encourages us again, right, to set our eyes on that prize before us. And that was all positive, right? We ended with all positive and there's more to come. Uh, but right now... We're in a little bit of the negative side. There's those glitches that can get in the way of the prize, the negatives, those things that so easily entangle us, corrupt us. And so with that, let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read, you know what, I'll just read from verse 1 all the way to 11 here this morning, and then I'll open in a word of prayer. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly, your sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, wrath malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator here there is not greek and jew circumcised uncircumcised barbarian scythian slave free but christ is all and in all let's pray Our God and our Father, we are we come to you this morning concerned to hear your voice, to hear the voice of God through your living word, the scriptures here before us. And so we pray that you will help us to shut out every distraction, that, that we may see you and, and know you and love you, and follow you, and live for you today, this upcoming week, for all our lives. We ask this in Jesus' sake. Amen. 
In the first four verses of chapter 3, which I read there, Paul reminds us of who we are in Christ. And if we, are, if we have believed in him through faith, then we have died with him, right? And we have been raised with him in this new life. And, and what Paul makes clear is that our new position in Christ should impact our lives in every aspect. And as we come to verse 5 here, Paul continues to emphasize how our position in Christ should impact the way that we live. And in particular, it should lead us to kill any remnant of the old man that still remains. For example... We know that no amount of uh, positive talk will cure a ruptured appendix, right? I've had one almost rupture. I know many others of you have had that. Um, and so it's, it's true. The doctor will have to physically remove the faulty appendix to get rid of the toxins in the body if it's ruptured. And this morning, it... it goes on it's more it's even a deeper issue deeper cleanse than that it's it's getting rid of something even more than talk to more toxic than the bacteria inside of something more uglier than that old white uh, shirt with armpit stains right it's it's the deep cleanse of sin and verse 5 says put to death therefore what is earthly in you Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. The wording here, put to death or mortify, you might have a different translation. Mortify is another uh, very extreme wording. It sounds very extreme, and it is, and that's because sin is so powerful. It's wrong. It defies God, it defiles the person, it destroys human relationships. And so the proper response here, as Paul lays out, is to tr not treat it casually like the world tends to, but to kill it. And so let's examine uh, the list from our verse here. We, we all know what it is, but I'm going to go through it. Sexual immorality or fornication, right? An act of sexual sin in such such as sex outside of marriage or adultery. Uh, impurity or uncleanliness refers to impurity of thought or word or action. Uh, lust here. Uh, evil desires, right? Strong, un strong passions, right? Uh, lust. Uh, evil desire speaks of intense uh, and often violent cravings greed or covetedness right strong desire to have something or someone it is said to be idolatry because it is placing worshiping something or someone else ahead of or instead of the living god uh, stuart bryso once said we're heading for a society that has only one virtue, one vice. That one virtue, that one thing to be desired above all is tolerance. And the one vice, that one wicked thing that is to be rejected and shunned is, of course, intolerance. As I mentioned last week, we live in difficult times. It's getting worse. And where Christians' beliefs concerning the types of moral issues listed here uh, stand in direct contrast and uh, with that which is accepted in the world, in our communities. It's an age now that is saturated with these things that we just read here. But we need to remember that this passage is not uh, aimed at the woes of society as such now that might come across as whoa i didn't realize that or maybe you did this list here is directed at us as christians it reminds us 
It's a reminder to be different. And Paul is saying to us about our sins, put it to death, right? Crush it now. Do it decis decisively. Sin must be dealt with drastically because of its deadly effects. That's what he's saying. Romans 8.13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Jesus, over in Matthew chapter 5, he uses uh, descriptive uh, language, graphic language, describing the lengths that we should go to shed sin and in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29, 30, he says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body to go into hell. Now, Obviously, when, when Jesus was speaking of this and Paul here, uh, they're not talking about physical surgery here, okay? Um, because you can cut off your right arm for stealing, whatever it might be, and you're going to go do it again. And so the next step is to cut off the left arm, right? It's a heart matter. The heart needs to change. Physical surgery is not going to change the heart matter. It's about fixing, right? One's heart on Christ, his likeness, directed at his likeness, his power. It's through the whole power of the Holy Spirit that brings about change in our lives, in our hearts. And so how do we do that? Right? If we're struggling in these areas here, how do we do that? How do we gain victory? Well, let's look at some simple truths before moving on here. First, very important is to recognize the presence of sin in you. We all know what we struggle with. So the first part is examine ourselves to God's word okay we get really good at denying our sins maybe we don't actually know that it's sin because we haven't been reading in depth in God's word we it hasn't convicted us yet and so as a result we don't deal with it okay Spiritual victory begins with identifying the enemy, right? If I don't know what I'm shooting at, how do I know that I'm going to hit it, right? How am I going to eliminate from my life what I don't even identify as needing to be eliminated, right? How am I going to eliminate the sins in my life if I don't even believe that I'm sinning? Secondly, we need a heart that is fixed on God. Psalm 57, 7, right? We must clean up all our sin, right? As we just read, kill it, get rid of it. Not simply sweep it under the rug, or compartmentalize it and put it in a little box over here or in our head, right? No, we need to starve it out. We need to cut it off. Otherwise, it's going to grow like a weed. If we don't pull it from the roots out, or we just take that top layer off, the roots are still growing. It's going to come back. And so we need to... Remove it from the roots completely. Thirdly, meditate on God's word, right? Day and night. This is getting into it, letting it saturate you. The way to kill sin is to feed it scripture. 
saturate our lives in his word. It's like poison to sin. Fourthly, spend time with God in prayer. We need to be honest with God. All right? We go back to that first step. Examine ourselves. So, where is it that I struggle? We need now to bring that, whatever it is, be honest with God, tell Him what it is, repent of that sin that is controlling us, pulling us away from Him, ask Him to peel it back like an onion to expose us, to expose the sin to us, right? Reveal every little corner of my life. It's going to hurt. For that's what needs to be done. Fifthly, cultivate obedience. Paul says, I haven't attained it. I, I haven't reached the goal, but I'm on that path, right? And what path was he on? The path of obedience. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, that our lives should be characterized by obedience to the truth. So, the question is, or the question that needs to be asked is, how am I doing in this? What do I need to work on in my life? Is my heart cold towards God and his word? That could be something. Do I, do I earnestly contend for the faith? Do I live to uphold truth? Am I sensitive to sin in my life? In the church. In our community. Alright, moving on. Verse 6 says, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. On account of what? Well, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. This verse serves as a strong warning that functions as, as grounds for this exhortation. Because of these things that are listed here in verse 5, God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. It's a motivator, <laughs> a big one, to, for continued faithfulness. The day of judgment will arrive. God will deal with our sins either with his atoning sacrifice of Christ or the unrepentant sinner will pay. Hell. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 5 to 6 says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God come upon the sons of disobedience. When we look around town, lots of events happening, even right here in Kimberley. What's happening in our society? With a breakdown of morals, traditional values, we automatically think it will lead to the wrath of God. And, and, and I would side with that. But that's not all. Romans chapter 1 verses 18, 32 speaks on this. I'll let you look that up on your own. When society moves from worshiping the creator to the creation itself, it isn't a sign that the wrath of God is about to be poured out, but that it's already upon them. Verse 7 says, In these you too once walked when you were living in them. Walking and living indicates their attitudes, their behaviors. It characterizes the kind of life that they have chosen to follow. But it's also a stern warning here for us as Christians. Without Christ, we are right with those, right, whose lives we tend to condemn. Actions, right? When you come to Christ, 
you came to him asking for for forgiveness for deliverance repentance from these things maybe your list was a little bit different but it's still the same point in other words we should know better Titus chapter 3 verse 3 speaks on that as well. The old saying is, right, been there, tried that, we've already tried sin, and you know what? It didn't deliver. For those of us that are in Christ, we see the old ways. They didn't work. Now that we are beholding the glory of Christ, we are being transformed. Why welcome these things back into our lives, right? Romans 6, 21, 23 says, But what fruit were you getting at the time from these things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 8 says, But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. The picture here is a person of a person changing clothes, putting off, putting on. This relates to the resurrection of Jesus. See it right at the beginning of Colossians chapter 3. For when he arose from the dead, he left the grave close behind. That's John chapter 20, right? Likewise, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, Jesus instructed the people to loose him. Loosen the grave clothes off of them, right? Let them go. We see that in, in John chapter 11, verse 44. Paul used these words here, putting off or laying aside twice, back in chapter 2. We saw it in verse 11, verse 15, where he talked about putting off that sinful nature and where Christ disarmed or stripped the powers and the authorities. It means to... Put it away from you. To not pick it back up again. Leave it for good. But how do we do this? Right? How do we do that? By remembering that we have been raised up with Christ for a different purpose in life. Let's go, let's go on a little small rabbit trail for a moment. We, we've narrowed in here on Colossians for a little bit. And so let's take a step back and view it from the Old Testament on, on this teaching here. What are two main times where God, where God poured out his wrath, his judgment upon the earth in the Old Testament? Does anyone recall? And incidentally, they are the same two times that Jesus used as illustrations of what it would be like leading up to the days of his return. What were they? As it was in the days of Noah. Violence. Okay, we see that over in Luke chapter 17 26 27 and it was in the days of lot sexual perversion you see that carrying on from luke chapter 17 verses 28 30 we also see this taking place there genesis chapter 19 if we go back to genesis chapter 6 verses 11 to 12 it says this now the earth was corrupt in god's sight and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. 
During the days of Noah, it seems God gave humanity 120 years to change its evil ways. God said back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Now often, and I've heard it used many times, this relates to, uh, we take this verse and we relate it to having that potential of living 120 years here on earth. But it refers to the time God's long suffering would continue with that generation. During those 120 years, Noah preached a warning message and God waited patiently for heartfelt reform. We see that over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Unfortunately, the people in Noah's time didn't respond to that message. Kind of sounds familiar today, right? They didn't care. They continued to live their lives the way that they pleased. They ignored God, and the longer they persisted, the more unsound their reasoning became, and the harder it became for them to change. What happened? <laughs> and Noah's flood came, right? God used this faithful man and his descendants to repopulate the earth. We see that in chapter 6, verses 17 18, that Jesus said that the world will be much the same before he returns to set up his earthly kingdom. Where did he say that? Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 33. He warned us to be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Just like he did with Noah. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 gives us a clear picture of the state of the world before Jesus comes. Now this is a little gut-wrenching. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderless, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Whoa, right? This sounds familiar. We're living this. As the violence and sexuality of this age increases, right? You can look up Lot, story of Lot and what happened there as well. God's message here becomes more fitting each day. All right. So it's easy to point the finger, right? Again, remember this passage is not speaking about society prim primarily. It's speaking to us as believers. Ouch. Paul is saying that we should put off all these things, the things of the world, put on the things from above. The first list went from outward acts, basically, sexual acts, to the inward motives. And this is what is the opposite. This list is, is the opposite. It starts with the inward. Let's take a review quickly. For example, maybe there's a little anger brewing down below. Someone has said something or done something you don't like. There's this little bit of anger that's, that's bubbling up away under the surface, right? Now, anger itself is not necessarily sin, but when the source of that anger is pondered and dwelt upon long enough, it can become rage. The next step, 
step down the slippery slope is malice. Malice is a secret intent to do someone harm, whether physically or verbally. The point is, you're out to get them back. That inward bubbling starts to build and rise and, uh, to the surface. And the results, here they are, slander and or abusive speech. Slander is the attack of, on someone's character. It can, be their, it can be to their face or quietly spoken to other, others behind their back. But the intent is to cut them down, to destroy their reputation in some way. And Paul is saying that these things ought not to be. It's not who they are anymore, who we are anymore. Abusive speech, lying, filthy language, malice, none of these is exactly the love, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit, is it not? There should be a change in keeping with the new creation that we have become in Christ. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so the question that we need to ask ourselves, are we tired of our sins and their consequences? Be done with them. With God's power, put them to death. And to put on the new which is in Christ. Here, verses 9 to 10 says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. The, the truth will take a back seat to our, our agenda if we're not careful and we'll say whatever we, we, we need to express our anger and our self-worship. Right? Lies are protectors of self-worship. Satan lied, deceiving Eve, in deceiving Eve. Adam and Eve lied to God, attempting to evade responsibility. The list goes on. That model was followed all through Scripture. You can find it all over the place. Today, it's something that we need to work on as well. When we look at our lives there can be no real community without trust and honesty. Deception is, de is the devil's native tongue. But the Lord himself is the truth. To speak the truth to one another and to do so in love and with tact is vital in creating a thriving church. Sins, as I mentioned earlier, are the glitches that bog us down. It's simply a man. Uh, manifestation of self-worship it's a rebellion against God where the computer not being us right it, it is glitchy and it often needs to be reboot, rebooted right in God's word and so Paul after laying out all these lists of sin moves towards the remedy the divine reboot a fresh start and the key here in this context is when we put off something, that being sin, it needs to be replaced with something on, put, replaced with putting on something that is good, right? To replace it. We cannot focus on the sin, but we need to focus on Jesus. So for example, if we're struggling with greed, we need to replace it with generosity. If we're struggling with pornography, we need to put on pursuing our spouse if we have a spouse. Put off gossip, put on encouragement, put off complaining, put on gratitude, put off anxiety, put on trust, right? And why we so desperately need the work of the Holy Spirit in us to become like Christ and less like our old self. That's, we need it so badly. We need to bear the image of the man of heaven. That's the goal. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, 
despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is good news, right? The new self is continually being renewed in the image of its creator. In other words, God is constantly at work in the believer's life, fashioning him in the likeness of Jesus. After all, right, it is here in the church that the divisions of the old self are cast off. Verse 11 says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. There was a time in our lives that when we thought we fit into a specific group and that group made us better than others. We relied on that group to feel approved. We found some satisfaction in that. But now, in Christ, as believers, all of that is gone. There is no distinction among believers because each one of us has received God's mercy, His grace. We are, as the body of Christ, must realize our unity in Christ and destroy those barriers that used to separate us. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15, 20 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The church should experience heavenly harmony among its members, since Christ is our unifier. I'll close with this question. What are the dangers in my life? Are they societal, sensual, spoken, or social? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you this morning been such a joy and privilege for us to be together here to sing pray listen to your word father we thank you for revealing so much about us and warning us about idolatry lord help us to live so conscious of, of your glory and your majesty that we we love you supremely that we love you with all our heart soul mind strength Father, lead us in the path of righteousness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.